everybody. Welcome to Relate Online. Happy Sunday. Happy we have Sunday. been counting down since last Sunday to this Sunday. I love Sundays. Me too. I love, I love getting to hang out with everyone here, but then I love our Relate community. It's so good. It's so good to listen to the message, uh, hang out together. Receive communion. Receive pray communion, together. pray for each other. We laugh a lot. And we laugh, we have a good time. We actually sing happy birthday, even though it's like, sounds really funny. But well, we've been, this is the thing, we've been on Zoom. We've been on Zoom. But as restrictions are loosening, there's possibilities to be able to gather in Woo! person. Yes. And on that note, if you are not subscribed to our Relate newsletter, yeah. you're not checking out the website, following us on social, make sure you do because we are planning um, get togethers through the summer as we work towards the fall and we are just excited about a reconnecting plan coming together yeah. as church family so i want to make sure you know about what's happening but you have to be subscribed to find out what's going on i didn't mean to say that i just threw that in there because we're excited about it's all so that's good. happening we're we want to reconnect and get back together yeah. but uh today is first yes and pastor dan is preaching today and we have some great worship so let's get into it
so, so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful
sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you And we live for you
you know, we celebrated Canada Day this week, and we wanted to take a moment to pray for our nation, to pray for the peoples of our nation, and to pray for how we're growing, learning, changing, healing, helping the world, hopefully. We feel pretty privileged to live in Canada. We do love our country. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to begin by reading from 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. And uh, that is our prayer. First of all, that we would be a church who would humble themselves and pray that this is the posture that we would assume that we would be humble both before God and just with people and recognize that we we have much to learn and to grow in. I think we as a church family have just been humbled by learning more about the history of our nation. And we feel pretty passionate about God's hand on this land. Yeah, I think that's such a a powerful example though that we can step forward first in is being humble and lead in that um, that stance that posture and towards the ones who are around us as we pray we can lead in that and uh, just pray that our nation will um, have an awakening and realize that they need to um, get on their knees and pray get on their knees and pray that God will um, just pour out his spirit on our nation and bring us together. Yeah, amen. There is much work to be done. There's much reconciliation that needs to happen. And there's all kinds of plans that we can make, but we ultimately recognize that it begins with God. We need God. And so would you pray with us? Would you join your faith together with us? And let's go to God together. thanking him for Canada and lifting up our peoples and this nation. God, we're so grateful that you've put us here for such a time as this. Thank you for the privilege that it is to be Canadian, to be um, right here, right now. And God, I pray that you would allow your church to be a place of healing. God, I pray that you give us ears that listen, that our desire would be to better understand. God, where there is pain and hurt, allow us to be part of the healing, bringing reconciliation. God, I pray that by your spirit, you would allow us to boldly um, bring the grace and the truth that you've provided us with. God, I pray that you would heal our land. God, heal our land, we ask. Restore our land. God, I pray that you would give wisdom to those who are in government, those who are leading us. We recognize the the weight that is on their shoulders, and we lift them up, and we, we pray, God, that you would empower them by your spirit. God, that they would have ears to hear, that they would uh, read your word, that they would be messengers of peace. God, I thank you for the privilege and the responsibility that each one of us has living here in this beautiful nation. God, I pray that in the weeks and months and years to come that you would revive us, that there would be revival that would sweep across this nation. Thank you that you are firing up your churches, God, and that you're giving us a fresh and beautiful picture of who you've called us to be. And God, I pray that that's what we would do, that we would be the church that you have in mind, God, that we would be the church that loves our neighbors well, that serves with a heart of gratitude, and that represents Jesus right here. Thank you for Canada. We bless her in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We um, are going to go into Pastor Dan's message in just a moment, but we always like to pause at this point and thank people, thank you for your generosity, and just share some thoughts around our investments, the the seed that we plant, that, that we sow. 
Sorry, I've been all over in your Bible. You have to find okay. your page I've got to there. Find it. I wanted to read today um, just a verse that uh, came to us in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 6, and I'll read from 6 to 10. And it goes like this. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and to give uh, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty there, plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. And verse 10 is, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. That's one thing we always want to encourage you is to, to spend time in prayer with our Heavenly Father. Pray, ask Him, Father, what, what do you have inside here? What is the Holy Spirit telling us um, to bring and to give in everything that we do? Not just on, on weekends, but the words we say, the people we meet and the words we say to them. Um, just really want to encourage you in that church as we um, stop and take this time to give. Yeah. That is our prayer for you. We're praying that as you are giving, as you are releasing what's in your hand, your bank account, your mouth, yeah. um, being generous with your time and your talents. Yes. And we have so many opportunities to do that you know, across the summer and as we head into the fall with um, our community projects, with our summer hampers, with just your, your giving, it makes such a big difference. But yeah. our prayer is that as you do that, you find that God supplies every single need that you yes. have Amen. and that he gives you more so that you can give more. Yeah, so good. That, that is really where the good stuff is in life, hey? Amen. Yeah. We love you and we are praying that over you and you have an opportunity right now. There will be information on your screen where you can give and invest in what God is doing through Relate Church. Well, Pastor Dan is up now. I'm excited. He has a message on the temple. Future Jesus Dan. in the temple, flipping Future the Dan. tables. Yes. So get ready. Here we go. Good morning, church family. Thank you so much for joining us as we continue our journey through the Gospel of John. If you've got a Bible with you, why don't you open it with me to John chapter 2, starting in verse 13. John is the last of the four Gospels in your Bible. It's, um, it's past Luke, but if you had Acts, then you've gone too far. I'll be reading from the NIV, and if you don't have a Bible, that's cool too. Scripture reading is new to some of us, and, and honestly, it's hard for lots of us. Um, one tip, if either of those kind of describes you, um, would be download the YouVersion app really quick on your phone. Um, I highly recommend it. And then I'd say just start where you're at. Maybe that's re-engaging a reading plan. Maybe that's just setting up the daily Bible verse notification to come to your phone. And then even if that's all you get each day, it's like this little nugget of truth delivered to your screen. And maybe right in a moment where you really need it one day. And I think that that's kind of cool, to be honest. So in the meantime, the verses will be on your screen as well. And I'd love it if you'd follow along, starting in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Verse 15, so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. Verse 16, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Another translation says a den of robbers. 
verse 17, his disciples remembered that it's written, zeal for your house will consume me. 18, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? Uh, unsure. Verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and they believed in his name, verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. He knew what was in each person. All right, in a moment, we're going to touch on the context of the passage as we always do as we've been working our way through the series. But first, a couple of fun thoughts on hermeneutics. Maybe that doesn't sound fun to you, but it does to me, it does to me. Hermeneutics is a big word, I get that. It's the theory and methodology of interpretation, especially as it relates to the Bible. Basically, it, like I said, a big word to describe the approach we all take to understand what scripture actually says in the passages that we read. So in hermeneutics, we ask questions like, what type of literature is this? What's the authorial intent? What's the context? Who's the audience? Is this history or is it poetry? Is it allegory? Like, are, are you David and is your boss Goliath? Like, are you Joshua and is that a big wall? When someone challenges me, can I call them Satan and tell them to get behind me? Because Jesus did that once, you know. Does God really know the plans he has for you to bless you and prosper you and make you a great nation? Is that an appropriate caption on a picture of the Tesla that you just bought on finance? Or was that promise just for ancient Israel? Is the passage descriptive, just a recounting of historical events, or is it prescriptive, a manifesto for right living, and maybe most importantly of all, how the heck do we know the difference? And, and, and these are big questions. Hermeneutics is a major reason why smart, well-intentioned people have very different understandings of the proper outworking of their faith according to scripture. It's because we apply different lenses to our reading. It's, it's why some people hold to a literal seven-day creation story and why some embrace aspects of modern evolution without feeling like it challenges their faith. Quick question for you. How do we measure the passing of what humans call a day? It's the rotation of the earth in relation to the sun, correct? I, I hope I'm correct. Now read Genesis again. Let there be light is spoken on day one. Yes, and that's all well and good, but a literal reading of scripture tells us very, fairly clearly that the sun and the moon and the stars, the celestial bodies, were not put into the sky by God until the fourth day. So I ask you, how did they measure the first three? And if that doesn't mess with your theology of creation just a little bit, honestly. I'm not sure what will. And, and am I making a point about creationism? Not, not really, but, but it makes you think, right? It makes you think. And this isn't a, a message on hermeneutics. Honestly, I'm probably, I'm definitely not even qualified to teach that effectively. But if, like me, you've wondered about how to read your Bible well a couple of times, well, here's a few tips that might help you out. These, um, these aren't mine. They're mostly taken from the author and pastor, Dane 
Ortland um, with a few additions as necessary. Uh, we've, we've quoted his book, Gentle and Lowly, a few times recently. It's on our recommended resources list for the series. And honestly, it's just a beautiful soul awakening look at the heart of Christ for his people. It'll make you weep. These points are not from that book, but here he uses Jeremiah 29, 11, which I just referenced as an example. Um, these are principles, though, that can be applied to all of scripture, and momentarily we'll attempt to apply them to John 2. In case you don't remember, verse 11 in Jeremiah 29 reads, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. On reading an ancient promise wisely, Dane Ortland writes, number one, this will be on your screen, we read it humbly, knowing that scripture is coherent, i.e. it's consistent. It doesn't contradict. God cannot lie. He is congruent with himself. Thus, if a passage seems to not make sense, I infer that I'm reading it incorrectly, not that God, the all-powerful creator of the universe, the arbiter of all that is good and true, is wrong. So, even, even if God gave this particular promise to ancient Israel, his people then, we know that he will act in the same benevolent way towards Christians today, his people now. And we see the heart of God in this statement, a heart that delights in prospering, not punishing his fickle people. And, and that was his heart for them. That is his heart for me. In the broadest of terms, I can apply this verse to my life. I think that's a good thing. Congrats. You can keep your bumper sticker. Number two, we read it redemptive historically. So in the greater context of the scriptural narrative. So we remember Eden the fall into sin, the calling of Abraham, and so on down through the centuries. So we consider that earlier in the story, right, God had always been seeking to bless his people, but that they have persistently rebelled. And we remember that later in the story, God will one day come back down to earth and really give them the welfare and future, the hope in the new earth. Only then, God's people will be from every tribe and every nation and every people, not just ethnic Israel. Jeremiah 29 is a part of a story into which I and you have been swept up. So it's applicable to me, yes, but I'm not the main character. Which leads us to three. We read it Christocentrically, okay? So Jeremiah 29, 11 is ultimately about Jesus. He himself said that everything written about me in the prophets must be fulfilled in Luke 24. So, we remember that the supreme plans for you that God had in mind, that was Jesus, not a Tesla. God promised welfare, not evil, for his people because his son bore evil, though he deserved welfare, and were united to Christ in his death and resurrection. So what God calls a hope here in Jeremiah 29 actually becomes a living hope because of Jesus by the time Peter writes those words in 1 Peter 1, 3. And number four, maybe most importantly of all, we read it spiritually. This is not a textbook. This is the living word. So we ask for the Holy Spirit's illumination because otherwise the beauty of this promise, the beauty of the promise of scripture, of Jesus, will not be truly seen and felt. So Bible study is important, but it's not transformational outside of the context of the Spirit's guidance. We read it spiritually. So why do I say all of this before I preach today on John 2 and Jesus cleansing the temple? Because this is one of those passages we love to apply to our lives when we need it. It's provocative. There's no way around that. It feels entirely un-Jesus-like in a way that seemingly permits us to act entirely un-Jesus-like, but like justifiably. What do I mean? Here's a meme. Here's a meme. Here it says, what would people do, or when people ask you what would Jesus do, 
remind them that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is totally in the realm of possibilities. And, and honestly, this one feels kind of harmlessly misguided, like something your aunt might post sort of tongue in cheek about nothing in particular. And she might rant on Facebook from time to time. We get that. But nobody like expects her to take any sort of meaningful action about it. I love my aunts. No offense to aunts. You're just an easy target. But, of course, the justifications don't end there. And they get less vague and they get more divisive. Small disclaimer before we continue. I am not making political statements here, I promise you. But I am making a comment on our hermeneutics, on the lenses we use to interpret scripture. As one author writes, I'm interested in the hermeneutics of the temple action because it reveals how our readings of the biblical text are betrayed by our self-interest, both personal and national, and how Jesus becomes aligned with us against them. Which leads us inevitably to lines like this, and I, I quote from an American pastor earlier this year, Jesus will flip the election like he flipped the tables in the temple. And that might feel valid to you, or it feels abhorrent. Regardless, this one, which is regularly posted in defense of rioting, probably elicits the opposite response in your heart. People, destruction of property is not a valid form of protest. Jesus, look at him. He's got the whip. He's flipping the tables. Everyone's angry. What's going on here? And it continues. I've seen this passage used by progressives and by conservatives, uh, by advocates of just war, okay, so we don't have to be nonviolent, okay, okay, by defenders of Occupy Wall Street, like drive out the money changers, in defense of violence against people, yes, in defense of violence against property. Jesus did it, so we can too, right? Brief but important aside, uh, it, it's got to be said. John's is the only account to include Jesus making a whip, he's just sitting there, he's braiding a whip, and it seems clear from the text that it was used to drive out animals, not to flog people. So just please don't make whips and hit people with them. I don't feel like that needs to be said, but I'm saying it. But regardless, the justification is often that if Jesus did it, then we shouldn't feel bad about defending our cause either. Because Jesus didn't just do it, right? He did it with zeal, with passion, with righteous anger. So get out of my way. I'm making a whip. You just told me not to. I'm going to do it anyways. I'm flipping the tables. I'm changing the world. And God is on my side. And if you don't agree with me, well, you'd have rebuked Jesus too if he cleansed the temple today. This is the last meme. I promise it's on your screen. And I get this. We could see and hear people saying these things out loud. So if God is for us, who could be against us, right? I think we usually apply that one correctly. So here's where we're at. This is potentially a sensitive topic for a lot of us. Maybe you're even just the teensiest little bit upset with me, and that's okay. It's not my intention. And I am legitimately sorry if you feel like I'm attacking your beliefs. Again, please hear me. I'm not making a political statement of any kind. In all honesty, there's a decent chance I might agree with you on some level at the very least about the particular injustice that provokes passion within you. I also might not, no guarantees. I do guarantee though that I don't think your passion about injustice is a bad thing no matter whether I agree with your cause or not. I think God cares deeply about injustice. I think we witness that here in this passage, I do. And I think he's hardwired a desire for justice deep within our being. We are made in his image and he is just. And that's led to some of the most beautiful moments of God breathed human decency in history. And this is a good thing. But I still don't think that we can use this passage as justification for bad behavior, no matter how righteous our cause. Let me just say, injustice is real, and it's terrible. It's not God's heart, and we have seen so much of it in recent days. And that makes our response to it as Jesus followers all the more important. Were there money changers in the temple? Yes, there were. But here's the thing. They were always there. 
They even served a purpose, at Passover in particular. I'm not justifying it, but, but listen, Jerusalem went from a city of about 30,000 to about 180,000. People flocked to the temple to offer sacrifices and to worship. Jews and Gentiles alike, they each had their own courts, they brought their foreign currencies, and they probably, just a guess, didn't carry livestock with them on the journey, right? It made sense to have a currency exchange. It made sense to have a place to purchase sacrifices. Now, was the system abused? Absolutely it was. Was it organized in such a way that these merchants made money at the expense of the poor? 100 per cent. Was it used to marginalize people from outside of the dominant culture? We're pretty sure that's the case. They set up in the court of the Gentiles, right? The place where the Gentiles are supposed to be able to worship. Do I think any of that is good? Definitely not. I really don't. Does Jesus care about these injustices? With all of my heart, I believe he does. One of my favorite writers, Ronald Rollheiser, a Catholic priest, he writes that no one, be that an individual or an institution, controls access to God. In this account, that's my own addition, Jesus makes this abundantly clear. See, there was something rotten in the temple. I don't think we have any doubts about that. That's, that's not the question that's at hand. The will of God for people was not being served. Human interests were. But is this a prescriptive narrative for Christians? See, I imagine these money changers were there the other times Jesus visited the temple, too, before and after. There's actually some debate even in Scripture about how many times Jesus cleared the temple, if it's once or if it's twice, because John places the event in different chronological order than the other gospel writers were here at the beginning. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they place it near the end. But one way or another, here's the thing. There were money changers in the temple, and this wasn't a surprise to Jesus. And then there was an emperor in Rome, too, and a puppet king in Judea. And I'm pretty sure neither of them had Israel's best interests at heart. There was even a traitor in Jesus' midst. And what does Jesus do in the face of this deepest betrayal, the ultimate injustice, the Son of God sold for 30 pieces of silver? Listen, he doesn't cast him out. He doesn't burst into his home and flip over G Judas's dinner table. He doesn't like shame him in front of others. No, he sits at tables with them instead of flipping them. And he teaches him and he washes his feet and he calls him friend. People come to arrest and murder him and he stops Peter's outrage, righteous anger, honestly, and he heals them. You see, here's my point. Jesus encountered bad behavior all the time. We can see it widely through the gospel narrative. And yet, what's his reputation today? See, even people who don't believe in Jesus at least genuinely, genuinely attribute a certain level of morality and goodness to him. Most people's issue with Christianity isn't Christ, right? We've said this. It's, it's Christians. He endured bad behavior, but he had a good reputation. Can we always say the same? Are we, if we quote Jesus, known as his disciples by our love? And when we aren't, to quote Joan Jett, do we even give a damn about our bad reputations? And I use the language intentionally because people's eternal souls are at stake after all. Or do we cling to passages like this? Do we fall back on Jesus' words in John 15? We'll get to it later, that if the world hates you, understand that they hated me first. And while those words have been undoubtedly true for faithful Christians throughout the generations, hated for their belief in Christ, and will be undoubtedly true in our future as well, and are undoubtedly true across the world today, quick question just for me and you. What if we are sometimes despised, not because we're Christians, but just because sometimes we're jerks. Jesus went 33 years flipping the tables once, max twice. Some of us seem ready to flip them every single day, and we all seem so sure that God is on our side. And in this way, take heart, because we're not so different from the disciples. When we read this account in the book of Matthew, it takes place in the immediate aftermath of what we call the triumphal entry. 
Jesus comes to Jerusalem for Passover, and he's ushered into the city by throngs of adoring people laying down their cloaks and waving palm branches. These are practices reserved in Israel's history for the proclamation of a new king in defiance of an existing one. They're shouting, Hosanna, which means save us to the man they believed could be the Messiah. And of course, he does, but not how they had hoped. And when he doesn't overthrow Rome, they turn on him and advocate for his death instead. And even his followers abandon him. Even, even Peter denies him. And in Luke we read that Jesus weeps before he enters into Jerusalem. And we have to wonder if he knew what they were thinking and hoping for. If he knew what kind of revolution they really desired. That they longed for him to be the leader of an anti-empire insurrection to overthrow the oppressor. But instead... After this display of the temple, we read that he quietly makes his way through the town, the humble and lowly Messiah on his way to the cross. You see, no matter how badly they or we want him to be, Jesus was and is not a political revolutionary. He, he is an agent of social change, yes, but he is first and foremost the savior of the world and everything he did was towards this end salvation and redemption for humanity. He came to die and conquer death, not live and conquer Rome. And what will we do when we come to understand that Jesus came principally to change hearts and not systems? Hear me, these are hard words and I'm not necessarily enjoying them, but my cause is not his, his is mine. And this is a statement of priority, nothing more. It doesn't ask you to necessarily invalidate your cause, it doesn't mean you have to abandon your battle against unjust systems, but it does ask you to examine the first lens you use to look at scripture and the world around you. Do we build the rest of our hopes and our dreams, our passions and our priorities on top of zeal for the Father's house and love for the people made in God's image? Or do we ask Jesus to play second fiddle to our political and social allegiances? Do I come to Jesus as if my cause is his or as if his cause is mine? And which more often frames my view on reality? And hopefully, not lost in all of this is what I'd consider a proper reading of John chapter 2. And I could be wrong. I'm willing to be. I'm willing. But this explanation is the one which makes the most sense to me given the larger context of Scripture and Jesus' ministry on earth. And it's, it's simply this. Jesus is acting primarily symbolically and prophetically, much like the prophets of old. Note, again, he's not surprised and sent into a fit of anger. Like, he knew he would, they would be there. This is a pre-planned activity. Note that he is not immediately arrested as a crazy person, but he's actually questioned by the Jews as to his authority to perform such a cleansing. This action is understood within the culture of which Jesus is a part. Who would be able to perform such an act? Only a prophet sent from God. That, that would make it okay. Anabaptist author um, Thomas Yoder Neufeld, he frames a sequence of events as this, a parabolic, as in parable, prophetic act. And he says, Jesus' explanation to the Jews who ask is enough of an explanation. Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. He says this is a symbolic destruction of the old temple, the old system, the old way of doing things in which people required sacrificial animals and a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And yes, they were oppressed in the process in view of the coming replacement by Jesus as the new temple, the new way to draw near to God and the new way to be saved. And this reading is, I believe, back to Dane Ortland, I believe it's coherent with the gospel narrative as a whole through the book of John. It's consistent with the redemptive historical framework of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The God has a plan to redeem his people. It's, it's Christocentric. What does this passage say about Jesus and his heart for people, people able to engage in true and pure worship and not about me and my immediate circumstance? And in all of it, I believe we can read it this way with a view on the Holy Spirit who prompts us with love towards people because of the work of Jesus Christ, the once and for all high priest, the, the way, the truth, the life, the new temple. And in the same vein, when the disciples remember that it was written that zeal for the Father's house would consume him, they're quoting from, from Psalm 69, 
Again, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. And while they might have initially applied it to their current circumstances within the temple, wow, look at all this zeal. The true meaning would actually be revealed, and they understand this in the aftermath, when Jesus goes to the cross. What does passion for the Father's house drive Jesus to do? It drives him to self-sacrificial enemy love. It provokes a willingness within him to endure suffering for the sake of others. So yes, Jesus acts out of zeal for his father's house in the temple, but then he continues to act out of zeal for his father's house. Jesus is an ongoing fulfillment of this prophecy. We can't just read it as the cleansing of the temples of injustice as being the outflow of his zeal. No, the cross was the outflow of his zeal. Healings, forgiveness, teaching, the outflow of his zeal. Jesus did nothing separate from zeal and passion for his father's house, and perhaps that's the application for us from the passage at hand to do nothing separate from zeal for the Father's house. And can I ask you, will passion for the Father's house consume us when it looks like suffering instead of standing? When it looks like the cross instead of the temple grounds? Will zeal for the temple consume you when it's being denigrated and destroyed in communities of which you bear no affiliation, when it's not your cause? People across the ocean or across the street, people with not just different but opposing beliefs to yours, the kind of person that you'd label a hypocrite or a bigot or a sinner, the kind of people who you think deserve to have their tables flipped. What about when they can't speak for themselves? What about when they talk too much? What about it? What about when they found themselves at odds with the established church? What about when they're out of your newsfeed? What about the ones who never entered? Will zeal for purification in the temple consume me when I remember my place in the story? Okay? We like to do this, but I'm not Jesus. Jesus is still Jesus, and if I'm to be found anywhere in this account, perhaps first, I'm to be found as the temple. It's Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, he writes that, Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. So the question I have to ask of myself, that I'd like you to ask of you, is, is when was the last time I asked Jesus to flip the tables on the inside of me and not just them? And church, I'm preaching hard to myself right now, I promise. I'm not Jesus. And honestly, one of the main ways I need to become more like him is actually is in zeal. Real talk, I call myself a moderate, but truthfully, I'm, I'm apolitical half the time. And whether that's the result of one form of privilege or another, I'm increasingly aware and I want my eyes to be open to the fact that there are real hurts out there that the church is called to soothe. People who need to be loved. And our world needs more passion, not less, but, hear me, it needs to be the kind of passion produced by the Spirit within us, not just the circumstances around us. It's, it's holy passion and it's righteous zeal, but it's, it's also loving kindness. And we're going to end in Matthew's version of the account. Immediately after he flips the tables, we read in verse um, 14 in chapter 21 that the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. The blind and the lame came to him, and he healed them. I'm an eight on the Enneagram, and that means nothing to you if you're lucky. But apparently it implies that I mind conflict just a little bit less than most people. And it is true, I, I've been known to fight for fun from time to time, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grow and not do that. But because of this, I honestly don't usually get too heated in, in arguments, discussions, whatever you want to call them, but there have been times. You know when you need to come down from something, like your heart rate is up and the blood pressure, and you're doing this with your hands, and the next person who says a word to you, like, they're going to hear about it. Like, I love Jesus, but right now he's left the building, and it's, it's just me in here, Okay. Everything about this account would lead us to believe that Jesus was heated, and rightfully so. I mean, the dude's Jesus. If anyone's capable of calling out injustice with righteous anger and moral authority, it's him. And yet, when hurting people limp to him in the midst of a shocked crowd, Jesus stops. You can imagine he bends down, as he so often did, and he talks to them, and he heals them. Passionate 
zealous and abounding in gracious, compassionate love for people. And then he goes to the cross for them all. The merchants and the money changers and the beggars, the emperors and the kings and the traitors. And we don't get to separate this story from the rest. Please don't miss the forest of God's love for the tree of his anger. And as much as we need to apply this socio-politically, and we do, far more than that, we need to apply this introspectively and interpersonally. It's easier sometimes to look out of the world around you, and there is a lot wrong there is. I imagine I'm still blind to so much of it. But unless I make change in here, unless I make his cause mine, love for God and love for people, unless I overflow with it, unless everything I am is pervaded by it, unless zeal for the Father's house influences all I do, the rest just falls inevitably short. And you might be called to change the world, and I'm sure that that will be a beautiful thing. I will cheer you on. I will pray for you as you go. I'm not against it, even for a moment. But I know for a fact that you and I are called to change our worlds the inner one and the outer one, the immediate surroundings of our everyday, ordinary lives lived as lights that shine in dark places and as love that covers a multitude of failings. And when we do, when we show up with love for the enemies in our immediate vicinity and compassion for the least of these here and now, even when they show up at the most inopportune times, like we're heated, it might not go on your newsfeed, but it builds the kingdom heaven. And that's the cause we're called to. It's faithfulness to the love of God for people in everything that we do. This is my prayer for you. It's my prayer for me. It's my prayer for us as a church. It's just this, God, would you flip the tables on the inside of me? Would you flip the tables on the inside of us? Would you renew our passion for the Father's house. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for that message. That was so good. It was. You want to flip some tables now, I want to flip you? some tables. Go crazy. Yeah. We'll just send you all off to have the best week, and you can go flip some tables. Maybe don't do that in real life, unless yeah. Jesus tells you to, but you go ahead, and uh, we love you. We love you. We love you.